There. I was just admiring better watches than you'll see at Basel World. Seriously, was Basel World 2019 a dud or what? I watched the whole thing, followed every release, and I was left scratching my head wondering where the watches were. Seriously, not a single drop of excitement. Patek Philippe, you redeemed the whole week, but you're just one brand. Friends, joining in from around the world, I can see Aza28, Joe D, Andrew. Guys, I have perhaps the most exciting group of watches on the table that I have ever shared in Watches Live. At least they excite me the most, and I'm in great mood right now because I listen to British Steel straight through. 44 minutes. It's like a metal album recorded by the Beach Boys. Super short. Okay, Jacob Casper, Dustin Van Patten, Cesar Demir joining in, and Andrew ST12 with Rich Buddy Friends. Let's talk about Rolex first and foremost, because Rolex unfortunately didn't deliver at Basel, so I'm going to make up for lost time. Rolex on this table is all prime cuts, starting with my favorite version of the Skydweller. Now, this one came out in 2012, but was only offered in steel, as you see here, in 2017. It's not as big a watch as people make it out to be. It's often lumped in with the Deep Sea and the Master 2, it's really not that large. Let me show you how it works. Uh, first and foremost, there is a rotating ring command bezel. It's an annual calendar in a GMT. There's a 24-hour register at center. There is a date, and then there's a little red dot that jumps from aperture to aperture. Each of the 12 hours represents one month, so you can see it's at the second aperture right now. That represents, that actually represents February right there. So let me show you how this works. You screw out the crown, and once the crown is out, you can see I can I can turn it and nothing happens. I can pull it out and nothing happens. I rotate the bezel once, and now I have the ability to turn the date. And you can note as I turn the date down to one, see how that little red aperture indicator jumps from January to February. That's how you use the annual calendar. You have the months and you have the date. Now let's turn the bezel one more time. I can adjust the hour independently. Note that this does not change the 24 hour register at center, nor does it hack the seconds. The watch keeps running. Turn it one more time. Now I've activated hacking seconds and everything moves in sync. I can adjust the 24 hour register, the hands, and it will drive the calendar, albeit slowly. You turn the bezel all the way back, push the crown back in, Thread it back down, and believe it or not, this case, as ridiculous as that bezel system is, this is a 100 meter water resistant Rolex. I'm going to throw it on my wrist right now and show you why this thing gets a bit of a bum wrap as a huge watch. It's a large watch, it's not a huge watch. Take my Zin Easy M11, put that on the table right there, don't worry that thing won't scratch, and then throw this Rolex on. Truth be told, it's a white gold and stainless steel Rolex. So the case and the bracelet are white gold, the bezel, which is part of the movement, is actually of white gold. So stainless steel white gold bezel. Easy watch to wear. It's just under 14 millimeters thick, 42 millimeters in diameter, big but not overwhelming. This is the ultimate travel watch with bright loom so you can read it in the subdued lighting of an aircraft cabin on the long haul. But that said, it is not the most popular Rolex travel watch. Friends joining in, I can see Alan Tudor saying, I'm still waiting for this. Love the Sky Dweller Blue. Watch yourself is saying it is thick. It is thick, but not as thick as it looks. It's 13 and change. And I could see Abdu Abu Sadiq joining in and Gary Huntress, Edward Ledden, and Rich Buddy. Abu, Gary, Edward, and Rich, welcome. Okay, let's talk about the most popular Rolex travel watch. That, of course, is the GMT Master, the dual-time Rolex that everyone knows. And this is the version from last year, the last time Rolex had a great Basel world. This is the BLRO. It is the blue and it is the rouge. It features the serochrome bezel. It features the Jubilee bracelet. It's a bit dressier than the same watch would be on an Oyster, but Oyster only available in white gold. And these days, white gold with a meteorite or blue dial. Now, the timepiece is slim. It's thinner than it looks at 12 millimeters thick. That is downright slender and thinner than a Daytona. An easy watch to wear. It's a dual time. It's 100 meters water resistant. It's steel. And although it's the super case, technically it is 40 millimeters. Rest assured, though, it looks and wears like a 42. If you want a Rolex 40 that wears like a 40, the late great metal steel bezel Daytona. All metal bezel, 
in steel. You could see this was the watch built up until 2016, discontinued for the current 116500LN. It's perhaps a better balanced look as the Cerachrome bezel is scratch resistant, but not as harmoniously integrated as the prior steel bezel. It's a classical look, and of course, 40 millimeters here without the Rolex super case, this does fit like a 40. It's slim at 12.2 millimeters thick. It's the three-day in-house caliber. It's a sporting look, and if you're a motorsports fan, this one will rev your engine. Of course, the timepiece also nicely constrained across the wrist. It's only about 46.8 millimeters lug to lug, 50 if you include the solid end links. But if you want to buy a 40 millimeter Rolex sports watch in steel for less than $8,000, and we're doing a spring promo price on this particular one, uh, not offered anymore, a discontinued piece and much missed as this was the old 40 millimeter Yacht Master with solid platinum bezel and solid frosted platinum dial. That is right, the dial itself features white gold hands and indices, but it is made of frosted or blasted style platinum. It's a graceful case. It really looks like a body double for the Daytona in terms of case form and case profile with the exception of the bi-directional rotating yachtsman's bezel. It's a handsome piece on the oyster bracelet. You can see it is a bit more robust looking than the Jubilee on the GMT. This is probably the best value in rotating bezel Rolex sports watch you can find. And yep, I'm throwing the turnograph in. Those are a great buy, but this is just a little bit higher in stature and station in the Rolex catalog. And this is a watch again you can buy for just over $7,000. This would be my choice. Of the Rolex watches I just showed you, this is the one that's most me. Jumping into the chat box, I can see Sebastian T. O'Neill Miller joining in from Chicago. We've got Captain Zed asking any root beer on the table, not tonight. None of your business saying, now this Daytona is great. Rolex is moving away in general from these beautiful watches. I can see Mark McGurk saying beautiful Daytona steel bezel. He's a fan. And I could see Edward Ledden is saying much better. I can also see that we have Bud... Stud, Bud De Stud, joining us from Colorado. Welcome, Mr. Stud, and Watch Doctor joining in, plus Abdul Rahman Abdul Rezik, a longtime fan of the show and one of our most prolific submitters of wrist shots. Watch yourself joining in, and JC from Midtown. What will the watch industry, when will the watch industry enter the 21st century? You know what? I'm frustrated with uh, Omega's embargo as well. They did their event in Zurich. I'm frustrated by the fact that they showed nothing except the press and then all under embargo. Let's go back to the Halcyon days of 2013, or pardon me, 14, and the arrival of the gray side of the moon. The black, the dark side was 13, the gray side was 14. It was the better watch of the two. Other than the Silver Snoopy 2, this was the most exciting Omega watch of the 2010s. 44.25 millimeters, all gray ceramic, but with the ceramic polished and finished almost like metal. You could see it looks like a steel watch, but it wears like ceramic, almost completely scratch proof. This too is a platinum dial watch with the same frosted finish on the dial and a fully loomed tachymeter scale. Even the crown on this watch features an Omega logo on its outer face that is fully loomed. The dial with a bi-register but a mono counter, so you wind up with a tri-register chronograph. You can see how the hours and minutes are on one scale. You've got Omega, caliber 9300 in the back, coaxial chronometer, silicon hairspring, 60 hour power reserve, under a wonderfully unconventional domed style sapphire case back. This is as good as Omega got during this decade. And again, from 2014, this watch has lost none of its energy. You can still pick these up for between eight and $9,000. And I have to say, although that's pretty dear for a pre-owned Omega, if ever a pre-owned Omega were worth the money, and if I were to put my money into a pre-owned Omega, it would be this or the, De the DeVille Hour Vision annual calendar. I really can't decide. I love them both. But the DeVille Hour Vision annual calendar is not a chronograph. Let me show you a cool detail here. This is often overlooked by a lot of folks who make ceramic watches. Full ceramic pin buckle, the pin and the buckle. Polished like metal, it's ceramic, so it won't scratch either. That's often the Achilles heel of ceramic watches. Dustin Van Patten, a fan of the platinum dial. Naresh Pape joining in from Canada, I believe. Greetings. Greetings, Naresh. He loves the gray side of the moon. You and me both. And I can see Brick Lane saying Swatch will be doing their own show. Swatch did their own show. We don't know what they revealed because it's all embargoed. Nice job, guys. You disappeared. All right. Let's see a brand that is not good at disappearing. A brand that is 
good at being seen, but often considered to be a little bit crude, unwearable, oversized. Well, you can be oversized and wearable, and this is a most unconventional Bell & Ross. They're not known for high horology, they're not known for refinement, and they're not necessarily known for ergonomics, but this watch manages to pull off an interesting horological angle with the Dubois de Praz regulator module on top of an ETA2892. And although this WW2 regulator heritage is 49 millimeters in PVD gray steel, it also features double hinged lugs that allow it to wear 49 millimeters from lug to lug. So believe it or not, but this watch is narrower across the wrist than the 40 millimeter Daytona I just showed you. It's an easy one to wear, clearly inspired by the Luftwaffe b -er of the 1940s. It's a huge watch and it has such a long minute hand that if you look at it for more than a few seconds, you can actually see it moving. Regulator dial at six o'clock you have hours, at 12 o'clock you have seconds, and at center you have the minutes. You've got a bi-directional rotating bezel with aviation style chunky action. It is a lefty, but it's an ambidextrous watch. This is a timepiece that has a lot of character, and shockingly, just like its distance across the wrist, it surprises in its thickness. Only 13 millimeters thick. One last look at this one on the wrist. You wouldn't believe it's that flat or that wearable. I can recommend this giant 49 millimeter watch for wrist as small as 14 centimeters circumference. Maybe 13 and a half. This one shocks. And jumping straight in, we have... Bud saying that one looks better on the wrist, and I could see Turkish Meister saying the Bell and Ross looks like a sunflower. I like sunflowers. All right, jumping into sports watches, classical sports watches, ultra thin sports watches, the grand dame of them all, La Doyenne, the very beginning of the high horology sports watch. From 1972, the Audemars Piguet Royal Oak Jumbo has been a continuum in the catalog. The original was the 5402. This is the 15202ST. 8.1 millimeters thick monoblock case. You can see the case back itself is part of the case. It's not a separate screwed on component. Monoblock and a front loader just like the originals. It features the petite tapisserie dial galvanized blue, the boutique exclusive. 39 millimeters in diameter. This one features a gorgeous caliber 2121 and you can see that one beating way at 19,800 vibrations per hour, entirely hand finish. This is a different level of finish than you're going to get on the 15400 or the new 15500. This is all hand finished. Not every AP is, but this one delivers. It's wearable, but it wears like a 41 or a 42. Although it's a 39, Royal Oaks wear huge. The watch is almost 52 millimeters lug to lug if you include those double end links that flare out. So this watch wears well on my wrist, but beware, like every Royal Oak, it's a big one once it's actually on your forearm. Glorious though, still slim, slender, elegant, handmade, and rare. Still very desirable. This is a watch that sells for 23,700 new and pre owned about 38 to 40,000. So if ever you were looking for a safe place to put your money, that guy right there. That said, it's got a rival on the table of equal status and stature, and that is the 2012 to present silver or silver white dial Nautilus 5711. It's a glorious thing that is a little bit thicker at 8.5 millimeters thick, but not much. It's narrower across the wrist, as even if you measure the rigid flare of the bracelet end to end, it's still only 48.8 millimeters. I'm going to throw this one on the wrist too. This definitely wears more compact. I can recommend this for smaller wrists. If you've got that 14 centimeter, 13 and a half centimeter wrist, you're going to find that a Nautilus 5711 is a much more agreeable partner than the Royal Oak. Even though the Royal Oak's a bit slimmer, this one's narrower across the wrist. And you can see in the silver dial, this is easily a dress watch. I would say this is definitely the more tropical of the two Nautilus 5711 dials. You got the blue, you got the silver, but this is a Miami watch. The AP you just saw is Philly, Chicago, London, New York. This is also an LA watch or Riviera Coast watch. Wonderful piece and very comfortable. It gets the edge over the AP on that front. That said, I'm about to show you a watch that one-ups both of them. A timepiece that doesn't have a whole lot of pedigree under its current brand name, but this is made in the former Gerald Genta manufacturer, which is high horology in the finest tradition of the Valley de Jeu. Not far from Breguet, Blancpain, Audemars Piguet, and of course, Jeger Le Coult, is manufacture Bulgari. And they do things the right way there. This is the 2018 limited edition version of the Octo Finissimo Automatic that debuted in 2010 and won the GPHG Men's Watch Prize. It's only 5.1 millimeters thick as my calipers measure it. It sits flushed 
with your wrist, wrist hair. Actually, flush with your wrist hair, once it's strapped onto the wrist, it sort of nestles down and it's almost like a limpet on your arm. It's only 40 millimeters in diameter and 46 lug to lug, so this is an easy one to wear and very light in blasted titanium. The bracelet itself is silky. You can see it too is titanium, wonderfully fluid and broad. The watch uses conventional spring bars and it, it can actually be fitted with a conventional strap. You just have to get one that's 30 millimeters wide. Take a look at the caliber. Entirely hand finished with a platinum micro rotor winding it. It's BVL138 automatic winding micro rotor 36.6 millimeters in diameter only 2.23 millimeters thick that's right it's less than two and a half millimeters thick the 55 hour powers are very impressive and as you can see Cote de Genève micro perlage below the rotor and on the base plate you have beautifully crested and you can see those are abrasive wheel Cote de Genève because one side is dark and one side is light from crest to crest they're not even in their brightness black polished screw heads, and all of that sized and shaped for the case back. The dial featuring transferred blue lacquer numerals. This one is one of 200 made for the 2018 model year, and absolutely glorious. It's not often you see such an attractive time-only watch with so much dynamism about it. And yes, the dial itself is blasted titanium to match the watch. Of the three I just showed you, Price notwithstanding, the one I want, the one that excites me the most, it's the Bulgari. And I can see Hale Bob saying he loves the Octo. Blue Shirt Buddha saying love the watch. Jacob Casper saying I don't love the blue here for whatever reason. Well, they have a standard version of that watch with black printing on the dial, so you don't have to be into the blue. That's a limited edition. And then right here, we have... Luis Ortiz saying, that one looks bigger than 40 millimeters, I guess because of how thin it is. Exactly. You can't swim with the AP or the bulk, where the Patek is 120 meters, so if you have to get wet, choose that one. Okay, sticking with our, our fine and beautiful watch theme, high horology, we're staying in the Valley du Jour, we're walking over from AP and Bulgari to Breguet. And this is the 5140, a timepiece 40 millimeters, in white gold, it features a grand faux enamel dial with glorious hand-painted breguet style Arabic numerals. You have those blued steel breguet hands. You can see there's a smaller disc of grand faux enamel that's placed under the primary to create that sub-register and create that depth. The timepiece is absolutely graceful with welded on lugs and a cold rolled case that's then hand finished to create that coined outer case profile we associate with Breguet. Solid white gold case back underneath is a Breguet 5023 with a silicon hairspring. It's based on a three-quarter rotor, Piguet P71 automatic. 46 hour power reserve, it's 11.5 millimeters thick on the wrist. Absolute simplicity, three hands, everything you need, nothing you don't, and graceful in its detail. From an arm's length, it's beautiful. Under the loop, it's equally fetching. A handsome and unusual piece. If you want a dress watch with grace and pedigree, but one that no one else has, Breguet, an underrated brand. And Dustin Van Patten asking, where did Breguet go? Well, last year they had a relatively unsuccessful rollout of their new marine line, and then this year they vanished into the mist in Zurich with the rest of the Swatch brands. So who knows? Again, the Swatch time to move thing, so far, not winning. And I can see right here, we have... Dustin saying he misses them dearly, and Rich Buddy commenting, I prefer Calatrava to this Breguet. It's not hard. The Calatrava has the name. I won't doubt that. I won't deny it. And I'll also mention that if you want a Calatrava-style Art Deco late Bauhaus-style design, but you want it in a bigger case of the same era and the same design sensibility, the IWC Portuguese. That one came out in 39. The first Calatrava, the reference 96, came out in 1932, separated by seven years. This one's a little bit different because it takes the image of an F.A. Jones pocket watch dial with the Breguet style hands, the painted and lacquered Arabic numerals, not in the Art Deco fashion. And you can see the watch with a lacquer base of 10 layers. It's then autoclaved and stabilized with a clear coat in several layers, hand finished on the top. This was a 3,000 piece limited edition for 2005 in tribute to IWC's American founder, F.A. Jones. 
Florentine Ariosto Jones founded IWC International Watch Company in Schaffhausen, Switzerland in 1868. So you combine the look of his pocket watches on the dial with the form of the Portuguese case, which has that blended lug profile that we associate with Bauhaus watch design, art deco design in an integrated fashion rather than the florid type of art deco. This is mechanistic art deco form following function. And you can see that the watch is quite slender at only 11.3 millimeters thick, although a 43 millimeter steel timepiece it does sit flat and easy on the wrist it's only 51 millimeters lug to lug so you can wear this even on my 16 centimeter forearm the fa jones pocket watch imagery continues on the case back check that out you've got damaskining in a pocket watch fashion you've got a three-quarter style bridge just like a pocket watch you've got pivot jewels set in golden chaton just like a pocket watch you've got that extraordinary more than 25 millimeter long Jones Arrow Regulator Index. The Jones Arrow stretching from the half bridge of the balance all the way over to the barrel bridge. There's a rich engine turned perlage across the base plate and it has an enormous stop seconds lever. If you look just below my finger, you can actually see the stop seconds lever moving. Get super close and look right there. You're actually gonna see the hacking lever right next to the balance, just above it moving and that stops the balance. That's how that works. 18,000 vibrations per hour, hand wound. It features a wonderfully overstyled pocket watch inspired click and click spring. Look at that mobile click in its spring right next to the right next to the ratchet wheel. A pocket watch movement, oversized and hand wound with a big slow beating balance and an overcoil hairspring. I like this a great deal. You can see that lacquered dial and it's 10 individual applications. It's wonderfully glossy and deep, although it does not feature applique indices because of the gloss and the depth, it appears more than the flat dial you would expect given the single layer of application on a base plate. It doesn't need cutouts. It doesn't need applique. It seems bottomless the way enamel does. I could see Logan Smith saying, I would wear that upside down with the movement showing. And I could see Jumbo Jet Pilot saying, video streaming isn't working well here in Anchorage. Uh, we're doing okay in the studio. That might be an Alaska thing. That said, I'm going to jump into a watch that is tough, Alaska style, ready for the wilderness. Whatever Alaska summers or winters might throw at you. This is a sports watch par excellence. The 2016 to present latest generation Omega Seamaster Professional Planet Ocean 43.5 millimeters in steel. The watch features a ceramic dial, not the lacquer that we saw in the IWC. This is polished ceramic, zirconium oxide with white gold hands and white gold indices. The Planet Ocean is the flagship piece, so it gets both of those features. Ceramic bezel insert. The watch wears well. It's only 48 millimeters lug to lug, so you can see that one on my wrist. It fits. This is a great big watch for a small wrist. On unconventional use of leather and rubber for Omega. You can see this one is an Hublot-like application of real leather on top of a vulcanized rubber base. Full deployant clasp. The watch features a Metaz chronometer. Let's see if we can show you that. Metaz chronometer certified 8900. Twin mainspring barrels, coaxial escapement, arabesque Cote de Genève with blackened screws, 60 hour power reserve. The difference between COSC and Metaz is that Metaz is an eight step test that includes anti-magnetism, water resistance, winding efficiency, power reserve, and instead of a five position test like the COSC, the Metaz is six position. Instead of a bare movement test like the COSC, Metaz is a fully cased up finer, final delivered product test of the full watch that you get when you buy the timepiece. And that's fitting. A watch that's a chronometer should be certified as a watch, not as a movement. Jumping into another sports watch that offers a friendly point of entry, we've actually got a spring promo price on this one. For $1,250, this baby could be yours. Oris Divers 65, 40 millimeters stainless steel, handsome unidirectional rotating bezel, a silver sunburst style with applique indices with a sort of e-crew simulated tritium fade, and it is super luminova with the look of a tritium fade, a dramatically domed sapphire to give you the look of a 1965 plexiglass dive watch, and of course the watch with a slim vintage inspired mid case and a simulated rivet style bracelet. This is an easy one to wear on any wrist. It has a nice trigger actuated clasp, so 
it's not friction fit, it's not a cheap clamshell. The watch feels multiples its price, and I have to say for around a grand, you can't do much better. A handsome piece, wearable, swimmable, and lots of fun. This is an all-the-time luxury watch, and a great graduation watch for that special someone taking a big step forward. I, I think I would be thrilled if I were a graduate getting an Oris. This is a lifetime timepiece that can also be used to mark a life milestone. The price is right, and the hardware is unimpeachable. Jumping into a Omega of a different stripe, we're going to take a look at a super luxury sports watch in just a moment, but this is the super underrated 2012 to present Omega Speedmaster Racing. Now you can see it features a graphite colored vertically satin finished dial with a sort of bumblebee scheme. It's a combination of varnished yellow hands for the chronograph and you've got that satin black with cross hatching for the black sub registers. So you have the satin in a sort of graphite, you have that wonderful metallic finish. You have varnish or lacquer on the hands, and then you have the cross hatch. Throw this one on the wrist, it's impressive. 40 millimeters, it's sort of the modern successor to the old Speedmaster Reduced. It's bigger than that one, and instead of the old Speedmaster Reduced 39, this is a 40. Instead of plexiglass, this is a sapphire, and the watch does have a broader spacing, 19 millimeter rather than 18 millimeter at the lugs, so it doesn't look vintage or quaint. What it looks is downright awesome. This is a wonderful alternative to something like a Rolex Daytona if you want a motorsports-themed chronograph. You can get this watch for about $4,800 and forget about the wait list at the Rolex authorized dealer. I'm telling you that, and we're a Rolex authorized dealer. Now, underneath the case back is an interesting adaptation of the Valju 7753. It's been converted to a column wheel from a cam chronograph, a coaxial escapement. It's been upgraded from 42 hour power reserve to 52. It's now free sprung rather than a mobile index, and it features a silicon hairspring. All of that, which is 100 meters water resistant rather than the 50 of the old Speedy Reduced. This is like a Neo Schumacher. If you remember the old Schumacher Speedy Reduced, this is like a modern update of that and wonderfully wearable. Jumping into the box, Ernie's saying not a Rolex alternative at all. If you discard your prejudice that nothing else is a Rolex, yeah, it is a Rolex alternative. That movement is sophisticated, the watch is handsome, the price is right. Don't be blinded by status and stature. It's constructed. It's like an Alexander Wendt thing. Okay, jumping right in, I can see Low Res Games saying, Glad I caught this live. Thank you. I'm always pleased when someone who's not able to catch me live does. And again, all you guys who got up early or stayed up late, I really appreciate that. And I can see Luis Ortiz saying, 50 meter water resistant on the Speedmaster Racing Swimmable. This right here is not 50 meters. This is 100. There's, there are two racings. There's one in a 44.25, and there's this. This is more water resistant than the other racing. Now let's talk about a real water-resistant, full luxury sports watch. A watch for which Rolex truly has no response. The Cadillac of divers, and still probably my favorite dive watch. This is the Blancpain 50 Fathoms. Not the Bathyscaphe, and not the Milspec in 40 millimeters. This is the full fat version with the five day three barrel caliber 1315. Five day power reserve, a lush, sapphire capped diving bezel, a gloss lacquered dial with white gold hands, white gold indices. This watch, 45 millimeters in diameter with screw fixed lugs, no spring bars, and an anti-magnetic internal Faraday style cage like a Milgoss, as good as it gets. Now the timepiece of course is large, but it's not a bully. You can see lug to lug, it's under 50 millimeters, which means you can wear this one easily on a smaller wrist. I have no trouble wearing this on a 16 centimeter circumference wrist. And I actually find that Blancpain did their homework to make this watch wear comfortably. Glorious on a sailcloth strap with a full deployant clasp. This is a comfortable and beautiful watch that feels, looks, and is luxurious. The movement is free sprung, automatic, adjusted in six positions, one more than a chronometer. And of course, surrounded by an iron cage, quick set date, stop seconds, 300 meters water resistant. You can see the marquee embossed on the case flank and all of high polish. This is a rich dessert indeed, but one that will leave you sated. No need for seconds when the main course is this good. Of course, you can see there is a sapphire cap on the bezel. I prefer this to ceramic because it creates a camber and a distortion that is gorgeous. Plus, it allows the entire bezel to be loomed, not just a luminescent pearl. So everything on this bezel is visible at night, and gloriously so. This is a swimmable supernova. See, what else have I got? Oh, I'm sorry. I've got the ultimate Gégère Lecoultre tourbillon watch. Well, compared to my old... 
Reverso Platinum 2 and certain Gyro Tourbillon options. Let's call this the penultimate Jejer Le Tourbillon watch. It's not quite as extreme as some of the Reversos, but this thing has the power and the punch to take your breath away. This is the Master Grand Tourbillon, a 300 piece, 43 millimeter platinum limited edition with tourbillon date and GMT. That's right, it has a 24 hour GMT second time zone. It features a hand that jumps from the 15th to the 16th straight across the dial. Let me see if I can dig my nails and I don't quite have the nails I used to. I do a manicure once a week so I can do those wonderful watch videos for you folks, which I like, but it makes it hard to dig your hands underneath the crown. Now here's the thing, when that date jumps from the 15th to the 16th, it jumps straight across the tourbillon, so the tourbillon carriage is never obscured. And you can see that the dial features both loom and all white gold applique indices and numerals. It's a solid platinum watch. It's an automatic tourbillon movement. The timepiece features the caliber 978 that won the Concorde de Chronometrie at the Horological Museum of Le Loque, Switzerland back in 2009. It defeated a range of chronometer specials submitted by other brands. This is not a chronometer special movement. This is a production movement. Not only did this movement defeat all comers, it beat JLC's own Gyro Tourbillon 2, the Gyro Tourbillon Reverso. I'm sorry, did I say this watch took a back seat to the Tourbillon Reversos? This thing is the Mac Daddy. 300 pieces in platinum, and it's the Heritage Gallery watch, as these 300 pieces were issued in 2007 when JLC opened its factory museum, the Heritage Gallery. One wall from Antoine LeCoultre's old workshop was knocked down to create the entrance to the museum, and all of the crumbled stone from that wall was cased in lucite, and each one of these watches comes with a lucite encapsulated piece of that original Heritage Gallery wall. So not just a remarkable watch, but a remarkable moment and a boxed set to match. This thing weighs like a metric ton. Like, you could get a hernia lifting this thing. It's glorious. Guys, thank you so much. Everyone who joined in, I really appreciate you, and I really thank you for making the live chat action-packed. I always read it after the episode. Everyone who tuned in, thank you. If you're catching me live for the first time, we do this every Tuesday. Two things to remember. We're doing an eBay sale from the 31st of this month to the 6th of April. You're going to want to check our landing page. Link in the description. Second, we're doing a spring promo where you can find watches like this Yacht Master and this Oris Divers 65 for prices that we will only offer for the early spring season. Guys, thank you so much for joining me. You make my job possible. Time out, Tim out, and thank you for logging on. Mm -hmm.